All right, hey theories class. So uh, here's my video I'm going to share with you um, so we can cover some material today even though we can't be together. Um, of course, some of us could have been together. We could have met in person, but I figured, you know, some of you probably have COVID or you're on hold or something, and I didn't want to be unfair to those people. Um, and I couldn't think of a way to, like, easily Zoom and then record the Zoom. So this is the way I'm going to do it. And, and we'll still have... Yeah, we'll figure out the Zoom discussion we were going to do for the Giga Renzer. I think we'll just have one discussion for that book uh, instead of two, but that's okay. We were kind of behind in our lecture material and stuff, so this will be a way for us to catch up, um, to only have one instead of two discussions on that. And then also I'll give you a little bit of material today that we would have done like next class. And then we'll be mostly caught up to, I think, where we should be. Um, if I grab my... little uh, schedule here. This is just the back of your syllabus I'm looking at. Uh, you know, it's currently the 21st, I think. So yeah, I'm basically doing the material we were supposed to do on the 12th. And then we're canceling the, 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 dis, the discussion of second book, part one. Uh, and then yeah, next class we'll maybe do that Kavanaugh talk or, or something. We'll see. We do have that quote-unquote review class on 11.4 to, to catch up a little too. So, Anyway, that's kind of where we are. Um, so, so what I want to basically do in this uh, lecture, I'm not sure how long it'll take in this little video, is, is, is talk about cognitivism. And uh, we talked last time about the ancient roots of cognitiv cognitivism, beginning with Plato, touched on Descartes, um, and also the people that Plato was responding to. Um, and then we also talked about uh, some more recent historical threads that led up to cognitivism, beginning with Wundt and Freud and Skinner, who cognitivism was sort of responding to, um, and Chomsky. And I think we sort of, oh, and, and also the invention of the computer. Um, so, in Alan Turing, the Turing test and stuff. Um, so that's sort of, those are all sort of the historical things that led us up to this moment in like the 1950s where cognitivism, I'm going to talk about one thing in, in the 50s that really happened that proliferated cognitivism quite a bit. So this is our goal, to talk about that, the sort of start of modern cognitivist theory. If I can get my slide to pr progress. There we go. So the, so the cognitive revolution, uh, I mentioned this last class, but it's just the idea that Skinner was wrong. Uh, Skinner thought thinking doesn't matter. He just wanted to see behavior. The idea with cognitive revolution is, is thinking does matter. Um, the, let's see how the mind really works. Let's examine its output, which is thought um, and perception and memory and language, decisions, etc. Uh, I use the word thought, which is a general term that might encompass some of those things, but these are specific incarnations of what the mind's output is. I've, again, and this is kind of like looking at the mind as a computer. You've got input, you know, you type some things, Alan Turing sets some knobs and the input is the Nazi code he's trying to break or whatever, and then the output is, you know, what the code means. Um, we're looking at our mind that way that, oh my gosh, some stuff goes into our eye, <laughs> not unlike the um, at atom theory of perception we were talking about last time, these things float into our eyeball except photons really float into our eyeball, and they, they tickle a neuron or whatever, and then the output is we see what we're looking at. We know what we're looking at. That's perception. Okay. Um, I'm just going to shut my door. Okay. So the idea with, these, with the cognitive revolution is we want to come up with models. Cognitive theorists want to come up with models of how the mind might be computing its output and test those models so you can make, you know, a computer um, model of how you think the mind is doing something and see if you get results that are like the results our mind produces. So you can study human output. So if, uh, you can study, you know, the input. You can manipulate the input. In other words, a, some sort of stimulus you can manipulate, um, especially with perception studies. You know, you can show someone something and then see what the output is, in other words, what they perceive. And then you can see if that model um, 
it, and then you can try and guess how they might be doing that and do the same thing in a computer and see if it works out the same way as it works out in people. If you get the same sort of accuracy values in different conditions and stuff. Or with animal studies, you can even see if you get the uh, what uh, neural uh, activations you get depending on what you show the animal. So um, this was the but the 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 idea of the cognitive revolution. You know, thinking matters. Let's let's study the mind again. Let's not ignore it like Skinner wanted to do. Had clinical implications. I think were very important in sustaining the cognitive revolution because people could look at it and say, oh, this is something that uh, matters. So this is Aaron Beck here, picture of it. He's very old. I think he's still with us. He's got to be like 100 now, but um, I don't recall hearing that he died, so I think he's still around. Um, so Beck was a psychoanalyst, like everybody was back in the day in like the 60s. Every, every therapist was a psychoanalyst back then. There were really no clinical applications of behaviorism yet in the 60s. So everybody was just a psychoanalyst, like doing the Freud thing. And so he was like that. He was actually an MD. Um, but he proposed that um, conscious thinking might actually matter for mental illness, not just the deep things that are below the surface that we're unconscious of, but also the things that you're thinking consciously. He thought those were important. And that might say, uh, seem obvious, given the water that we swim in. And remember, this is water. Um, nowadays, everybody probably thinks that, that, that what you think consciously matters. But back then, no one thought that. Um, so this was a step forward. Um, people used to think his big thing with depression, uh, he, he, depression was his first focus in his research and stuff, Aaron Beck, and he, um, he just thought the thoughts that you have, like thoughts of beating yourself up, you know, like I'm worthless or I stink or I'm never going to be able to do well, uh, no one's ever going to love me, those types of thoughts that you would consciously have, he thought those were very damaging. And if you could change those thoughts, people would get better. Lo and behold, Research studies have shown many times that he was correct, that those thoughts do matter. Um, so that was another in, in clinical side of the cognitive revolution. That's not what we're going to talk about for the most part. We're going to talk about the more basic research side of things. And we're going to start with these studies, landmark studies, of how visual neurons work, uh, how they do their job of seeing. So we're going to talk about these guys, uh, David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel, who did their work in the late 50s and early 60s. And they won the Nobel Prize for their work. This was a really, really big deal, what they did. Um, but before we talk about their work, I want to try to tease you a little bit and get you feeling um, a little bit how uh, crazy vision is. Um, it, it, really feels like it's a boring topic that's very um, effortless for our mind to do and stuff. Uh, it, it's not something that is interesting, I think, for a lot of people, th that of visual perception, how our minds perceive uh, the, the visual world, because it seems so effortless for us as we're walking around the world. But I want to point out a couple things where it's not effortless and you can't tell what you're looking at. So for example this, what is this? I'm trying to imagine what I might think it was if I didn't already know what it was. I'm not really sure. I pretty much can't tell what that is. Just by looking at it. I know what it is. It's actually um, it's a close-up of my old Honda Civic I used to have, and I had, um, it was like getting really rusty at the bottom of the door, and I like tried to sand off the rust, and I used like, you know, Rust-Oleum or whatever, and then I like Mako'd over it, like they used this like basically spackle for cars that I put over the old rusty spot, and then I painted it with like this nice touch-up paint. Um, if you ever need touch-up paint, I believe it's AutomotiveTouchUpPaint.com is a great website to go to. They can match any color. Um, and then I sprayed it with that and everything. And But then, like, a, a month later, the rust started leaking through the work that I had done again. So this stuff here is like rust that has leaked through a paint job. So see here. This is a zoom out of what we were just looking at. I think we were zoomed in, like, right around there or something. So you can probably 
recognize, you know, that's the door, the bottom of the door, and this is the bottom of the car. So that's what you were looking at before, but your brain couldn't tell that. Couldn't tell it was car metal, probably, right? Probably couldn't tell it was a car at all, or that that was rust. So there are times where your brain is actually cheating a lot. It's using context clues, like, oh, there's a line there. Looks like that's something that could move. Maybe it's a car door. Or maybe you couldn't have even told this was a car door, but if I hadn't told you that, I'm not sure. What about this one? What is this? I don't know if you could come up with it, but it's a, it's this, it's the, you know, this weird glass uh, that was casting a shadow. And it was zoomed in on that. Um, let me do one more. What is, uh, where is it? Oh, this one. Yeah, what's this? Or even if I, I probably should have zoomed in even more. Then you might have realized, or like if I go to a weird spot, you know, like this thing. What is that? Is that like some massive valley and we're like zoomed out from space? That's kind of what it looks like to me. This might be like the peak of a high mountain nearby. That's kind of what I see. Maybe these are like little forests or something as you get closer to the, maybe there's some water here at the bottom of the valley that's nourishing these forests i don't know but really what it is is not that if you continue to zoom out probably still can't tell it could still plausibly be what i just said the surface of mars or something actually if you continue to zoom out you'll see the shadow of my wife this is uh right here is the edge of the water this is a place in the white mountains called uh, the ladies bath and uh, it's in Lincoln, New Hampshire, and it's like this crystal clear water that's really still and like 10 feet deep in the uh, Pemigewasset River, and you can swim in this uh, icy cold but deeply refreshing water. And that's what uh, was zoomed in on here. And you probably couldn't tell that. So I'm just trying to point out that vision is harder than you think. Um, although it's field effort, our brain does not let us know how hard vision is, but there's a lot going on behind the scenes to try to figure stuff out. And there's a lot of things that you can't tell what they are unless you have the context. Um, so it's harder, harder than we think. Um, in fact, about half of your brain uh, is devoted to vision. So, you know, you've got your occipital cortex in the back is strictly devoted to vision. That's a quarter of your cortex. And then your parietal cortex is about half for vision. And your temporal cortex is about half for vision. So if you take a half plus a half, that's one lobe. And then another lobe back here, that's half of your, half of your four lobes. Two, two of the four lobes you have basically are devoted to vision. So believe me, it, it, evolution and God wouldn't have devoted that much um, neural resources to vision if it were an easy thing to do. It, that would be a waste of neural energy. Um, it's really, really hard to see. And that's one of the things our brain does the best actually is seeing. It's what it's in addition to language, it's something that really separates us from a lot of other animals. So you look at something like this, and you know, how does your brain know that this is a carrot car? <laughs> if it, this wasn't written here, you probably could have said, Oh, that's a bunny riding a carrot, that's a car. How does your brain figure that out? This is a novel object, you know, you'd never seen before unless you read those uh, Richard Scary books when you were a kid. So, yeah, there's a lot of mystery in vision. So, you know, back in the day, people used to think this is how we see. This is a, this is called a Cartesian theater because this is actually another Descartes idea. And, you know, it's like, how do we see the world? How does it work? How do we know what we're looking at? And we talked about, um, who was it? Uh, was it Democritus? Yeah, I think it was Democritus last time. You know, he thought those little atoms of, 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 of I'm looking at a mouse, it's made up of these little atoms that are mini versions of it, and they go into my eye. That's obviously not right. So how does it work? How do we know what we're looking at? Well, this is sort of what Descartes proposed. He said there's, in your head, is a soul, and it's basically sitting there watching a, something like a, a theater, a movie theater that your eyes project. So light goes into your eyes, they project to um, this screen, basically, of, a, of like a theater of what's going on on the outside, and your soul sits in, the, in there and watches the theater. So 
that's fine. I mean, if you believe in a non-physical soul that does all the work, sure. Um, but that's not right. <laughs> because, uh, you know, you can, if you, if, you, if you damage certain parts of your brain, you'll see that, oh, you can no longer see aspects of the visual world. So it's not just that you have this soul floating in your head that's watching a theater. That is what Descartes thought because of his whole dualism thing, but that's not true. Um, so, uh, you know, this is an actual drawing that Descartes made. Um, of course, you know, movie screens weren't invented back then, but the theater was there. So he thought maybe it was something like an actual, you know, theater you'd watch a play in that was going on in your head. Um, and he said, you know, okay, light bounces off of the arrow here and it goes into your eye. And see the light ray is hitting the back of your eye and then it connects to your brain and, and then your soul is somewhere in here watching it. And he was correct about all this because of his dissections and stuff. That's true. Your optic nerve connects to parts of your brain and so forth. The only thing he was wrong about was this soul sitting in there watching it. There's, there must be another way that it works. So these guys, Torsten uh, Wiesel is this guy, and this is David Hubel. They made a tremendous progress in figuring out the hard question of, well, how does it actually work if it's not some soul sitting in your head watching a movie? Um, so I'm going to try to explain more or less what they did. Um, what they did, and this guy David Hubel was uh, one of these really uh, clever um, individuals. He was an MD actually, so he had finished medical uh, school, but he wanted to do research. And um, this guy uh, at, at the NIH, whose name I forget, he went to be a postdoc for that guy. So this established researcher, this guy went to work for, and, and same with, with, with uh, Wiesel. Um, but David Hubel, uh, I don't know if you got there first or if you just uh, thought of this, he decided to make this uh, very precise uh, device that you could, um, like, you know what a pipette is? Do you remember from biology class or something? It's like this thing, almost like a syringe or something that has like a tip to it. And, you know, you can squirt water in somewhere or, or squirt a chemical in, in somewhere with this pipette. Or you could draw water out, you know, with a pipette. Um, precise amounts of water, basically. It's kind of like this syringe type thing. Um, Hubel made a pipette that was really advanced in the sense that it had a very fine tip, finer than any pipette tip anyone had ever made before. Uh, and it was so small and it uh, was designed in such a way that it could measure electrical activity from a single neuron. So you could basically take this pipette and put it in the brain of an animal right next to one individual neuron. You wouldn't know which neuron you were in because you just kind of like squirt it in there or squish it in to the, the animal's brain. But you'd be like, this tip of this thing is so small. I know I'm next to like one neuron. It's not like big enough that I'd be next to a couple at, a same, at the same time. So he made that device somehow using his, his ability to engineer, even though he was an MD, uh, not an engineer. And he used that to his advantage. So he, he would... Um, do these experiments with Wiesel where they would take cats uh, and they would anesthetize the cats. They'd have the cats, um, you know, just sitting there like looking at a screen, anesthetized. So they, the reason they anesthetized them is that they didn't want the cat moving around the, his, his eye. They wanted to keep the eyes still, just staring kind of vacantly. And while the cat was kind of staring vacantly, they would show the cat things on a screen and they would measure what this one neuron that they happened to be next to was doing. And they could do it in real time because they took the other end of the pipette was connected to a wire, which then connected to an amplifier, which connected to a speaker. So every time the neuron that they happened to be next to fired, every time it did an action potential, they could hear it. It basically sounded like a crackling sound. Uh, they could hear it live. And I'll play you that because um, it's pretty amazing to watch you what that sounded like. Try 
for my wallet, I just wanted three things. It had to be simple, really easy to access your cards, and last forever. All right, so can you hear that? That's the neuron firing. It's firing many times every, hear, every time you hear that crackle. Now watch the light. So see, you can barely see. I hope you can see my cursor here. This is a little circle they've drawn on the screen. So what they would do would be that, you know, remember, there's a cat sitting there looking. And they would shine light all over the screen, almost like a searchlight, shining here and there, trying to find where on the screen I need to shine a light to get this neuron to fire. And they've kind of identified where it is. So for this particular neuron, it's right around where they drew this circle. So watch the light and listen, and you will hear when the light is on that circle area, the neuron fires. And when it's not, it doesn't. All right, now they're getting a little fancy. Let's watch the beginning again. You hear that? That's probably the most demonstrative part, I think. It's like this uh, string of action potentials. Every time they pass over that little circle, vroom, 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 it's like a snare drum almost. And then if they turn it on and off, you know, it, it's, it, it works as well. So what th they're showing here is they actually didn't discover this. They're advisor, the guy that they were working for as postdocs, had, had done some work to demonstrate this. That the way your eye is set up and the way your brain is set up is using something called receptive fields. So uh, every neuron in your brain, in your vi visual part of your brain, pretty much, has what's called a receptive field, meaning that there's an area of space that it's responsible for. So the neuron that their pipette thing happens to be next to right now is responsible for that area of space right there where that circle is. And the only reason the circle is there is they drew it on a, on a board so that they'd remember, ah, this is the spot that this neuron likes, okay? If they move their pipette a millimeter to the left, they're gonna be next to another neuron, and that neuron will be responsible for some other area of visual space, you know, maybe like a few feet to the left or whatever. So that's the way our brain is organized in terms of vision is that every neuron back there, the, the, the main neurons in our, in our visual brain that begin back here in, in the back of your head, everyone is responsible for a particular part of space. Okay? That's called a receptive field. And uh, Hubel and Wiesel discovered that. Uh, they also discovered more than that, but I think I'll tell you about that later. I'm going to go back to my slides so I remain organized. In my presentation, hopefully. All right. So, yes, um, that based on their advisor's findings, who had sort of discovered about the receptive fields and stuff, each neuron is um, part of a certain area in space, they were beginning to, to answer Plato's question of how do we know a chair is a chair? Descartes kind of took this lame cop-out excuse of saying, oh, the soul in your head watches a, a theater. Well, how does the soul in your head know what it's looking at? You know, it, for Descartes, it was basically magic. It was this non-physical uh, thing called a soul, which, of course, you know, that's not uh, constrained uh, by, you know, the things that our physical bodies are constrained by. So, of course, the soul can see. But I don't think that's right. I don't think that's how we see that there's a soul in our head. So, if, if that's not true, then how do we see? Well, these guys started to figure it out. So first of all, okay, each neuron is looking at a basically different part of space. Um, but they went beyond that. So they wanted to take an empirical approach, in other words, an observational experimental approach to see how neurons in our brain work, see what they're doing. And they assumed that the visions uh, that the uh, that the neurons in the back of the head were very important for vision. 
So those were the ones they started measuring in, in cats, in the back of the head, in the occipital cortex. They knew that the occipital cortex, the back of your head, is important for vision because guys would come home from war and they'd get shot in the back of the head or something, or they'd like get hit by something really sharp in the back of the head and it would damage part of their brain back there, and they would go blind. And you don't go blind if you get hit in the front of the head, you know, by a bullet, um, and you somehow survive. Uh, it's the back of the head seems like, wow, it's important for vision. And plus, if you take a cat and you just like mess up back there, you lesion, you kill some neurons back there, it will cause visual impairment. So they knew the back of the head was important for vision. They wanted to get in there with their pipette thing and measure what are these neurons doing. So they use this method I was telling you about before. It's called single cell recording. Um, and their advisor did single cell recording of the optic nerve fibers. Those are the fibers that just go from your eye to the middle of your head. Um, and he, you know, kind of discovered that, ah, they're each, each neuron is for a different part of space. They have receptive fields. And these neurons respond to spots that are shown in their receptive field. So I already showed you this YouTube video here. This is a reminder for me to do that. Um, so, this is, uh, we're, we're doing good. Okay, so Hubel and Wiesel, it improved, uh, David uh, Hubel primarily, I believe, improved that pipette so that not only could you measure the optic nerve fibers, which are fairly large, you could even measure the smaller neurons in the back of the brain. And they began to understand how vision works at least in the early stages. They no longer needed this Cartesian theater. So here's what they discovered. Let me show you another video on YouTube. Okay, let's look at V1. V1 is what you call the back of your head. In 2014, All right, so remember that first neuron I showed you firing? That was an LGN neuron. Basically, it's a neuron that is, is, is directly repeating what the optic nerve fibers are doing. It's just a neuron um, that likes spots, okay? But if you just had a bunch of neurons that fired when a spot was shown in their area, you'd be like, ah, there's stuff. There's stuff everywhere. <laughs> but you wouldn't know what any of that stuff was. It would just be like a bunch of pixels on a digital camera and guess what? Digital cameras have no idea what they're looking at. They could never perform any action based on you know, what they're looking at. You need a lot of computation like your cell phone has in addition to the visual camera part to know that stuff. So the, they, the next neurons in the sort of visual stream that connect to those optic nerve fibers are in the back of your head. It's called V1, primary visual cortex. So this is a V1 neuron. And what, the, what it's going to do is it's going to fire in a different way than the LGN neuron did. Let's see if we can watch and see what it does. For some reason, it's like fast forwarded to the end. All right, it's all dark right now, I think. Okay, starting to shine a light. They're shining a bar now instead of a spot. And he's making his marks on the board because he's like, okay, I think this is where this particular neuron likes stuff to be. Right there. If I shine it over there, it doesn't like it. This neuron likes where I made those X's, I guess. Okay. Doesn't like over there. Only there. Or like, you know, half an inch diagonally up and to the left and half an inch diagonally down to the right. But yeah, even if I do a big bar, it doesn't like it. It's starting to fire when I shut lights off over here. That's a little complicated thing we're not going to get into. He's drawing something to symbolize that. But let's not worry about that. Let's see if he shuts it off over here, I bet it'll, it'll fire. Off and get a little fire. Off and get a little fire. See those little symbols over there to show that. That's David Hubel's hand, I think. Or Wiesel's. Okay, so now what he's going to do, look. 
if he passes through that same area, this is critical that you understand this, it doesn't fire. Watch it again. So I, uh, this whole time he's demonstrating this area where the X's are is where this neuron likes. But if he passes it through at a different angle, through the same area in space, the neuron does not fire. It's not firing. Not firing. Fires a little bit of, at that angle. Now it goes berserk if it's at that angle. Loves it. Loves it. A little bit. The further he gets from that critical angle, the less it fires. And now if you get all the way over there, it's not going to fire at all. Going to fire. So this is called orientation selectivity. It means that the neurons in V1 are not like the neurons in the optic nerve in an LGN. Um, LGN is just this part in the middle of your head that the optic nerve fibers connect to. These guys fire for spots. These guys fire for lines of a particular orientation. Okay, so there's one neuron that will fire for, in this part of space, say over here, you know, it'll fire for lines that are at this angle. There's another neuron, you know, a millimeter to the right of him who likes a different angle or a different part of space. But you can imagine that now that you have this type of neuron, you could kind of sum up the activities of a bunch of these neurons and you could know a little bit what you're looking at based on their output. So if I've got one, you know, that's firing, um, that I know likes this part of space and another one I know likes this part of space and they're both firing a lot and they both like vertical angles, I know that there's two lines that are parallel to each other in this part of space and this part of space. Add that up with maybe some that are like this and some that like this part of space, they're also firing and they like horizontal lines. Holy crap, if those four sets of neurons are firing at once, I know there's a box there, okay? That is the beginnings of how we see is summing up these types of orientation selective neurons. So this is how we see, it's not some soul sitting in our head. It, and this is just the beginning. There, there's so much more that we still don't understand about how we see. But Hubel and Wiesel with this orientation selectivity stuff began to crack that code, if you will, to go back to Alan Turing, of how our brain is actually making sense of what it's looking at. It's, it's these types of neurons here, orientation selective neurons. There's other neurons in your head that are motion selective. They only fire if stuff is in their receptive field, their part of space that they like, and it's moving to the left. There's other neurons that same part of space, they only fire if stuff is moving to the right. So that's how you know stuff is moving to the right or to the left, is its particular neurons happen to be firing. That's how your brain is, is knowing that. Um, and then you get further down the visual stream to places like in the temporal lobe, and you have particular neurons that fire for women's faces, or attractive women's faces, or old people. Like, there's particular neurons that are very specialized for different types of seeing. There's even one they found once that, would, that only seemed to fire in this person's head. They, they had a person who was having brain surgery, and um, they said, hey, can we measure some of what your neurons are doing if we show you some stuff? It's not going to hurt you, which it, it wasn't. And he was like, okay. So they showed this person thousands of pictures and there was one neuron that only fired for Jennifer Aniston. Um, it's called the Jennifer Aniston neuron. <laughs> so it's very specific. It didn't fire for other actresses and stuff. It was crazy. So this is how we see. Hubel and Wiesel began to understand that. And eventually, I guess, if you took all the neural activity from those, you know, orientation selective cells and stuff, and maybe you have color selective cells, if you add all that up, maybe you can start to intuit how we might know that this is a carrot car. That, oh, okay, there's something orange. I can understand that and put it together with the bunny and um, the wheels and stuff. And I have circle, I have cells that like circles and so forth. You put all that symphony of activity together and you can basically know this is a carrot car. There's a lot of details in there that are still not understood, but basically something like that is probably how it works. So that was a really big deal. As I said, they won the Nobel Prize.
Google and Weasel. I saw them talk once um, at MIT like 10 years ago. I think um, at least Hubel has passed away now. I don't know if Weasel is still with us. Um, but it was really cool to see them. Um, it was a, a real landmark in the understanding of our brains and our minds. So that's all I'm going to tell you about for this little video, and we'll pick up from there, but I definitely want you to understand a bit about Hubel and Wiesel uh, going into the next lecture. Ne next lecture. And uh, if you have stuff that you didn't understand from this lecture, please write it down. Uh, write down your questions and bring them up uh, at the beginning of next class so we can uh, hash through together and, and get on the same page. I look forward to seeing you on Tuesday. And thanks for rolling with the punches and uh, being flexible today with the whole internet being down.